You're watching. You're watching. You're watching. West Hartford. West Hartford. West Hartford. West Hartford. Community television. Community television. Community television. For the community. 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 By the community. By the community. By the community. By the community. And it's a rock. Hello and welcome back to The Foundation Presents. My name is Mike Schramm and I am a member of the board for the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools, a private nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding upon the curriculum taught within the West Hartford Public School system. The foundation was founded in 1997 with the goal of making a small impact in the West Hartford schools and over the past 20 years has funded over $1.4 million in grants throughout all 17 schools in the West Hartford public school system. I'm here today to introduce you to three educators who will talk about their experience with the foundation and the grants that they conducted with their students in the 2016-17 school year. But I can tell you that in the 2017-18 school year, the foundation has funded 72 grants to the tune of $85,000. All of that money has come from businesses, families, and individuals in the broader West Hartford community and shows the dedication of the residents of West Hartford to the schools that make up the backbone of one of the best towns in the great state of Connecticut. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my first guest. And now I'd like to welcome Kim Ashworth, who is a first grade teacher at Morley, and our special guest, Zoe. Kim and Zoe, can you guys tell me a little bit about your grant, Knits, A Great Way to Help Others? Sure. Um, so we, um, I developed this grant um, to help children in first grade, actually mm -hmm. not just first grade. Um, kindergartners did it, right? First graders, second, not second, third and fourth graders. Okay. Um, so there were 80 looms that were purchased, mm -hmm. and we wanted to uh, we wanted to teach the children um, about helping others and reaching out into the community. Okay. Um, and sustainability. Mm -hmm. So, the looms and the wool and everything was sourced from specific places, right? Can yes. you tell me a bit about that? Um, so this company, which was um, actually developed by a nine-year-old girl at the time. Oh, wow. Um, she, um, there are different parts of the world that source the wool. Mm -hmm. And this, we, we picked um, Chile for the, um, where this wool was sourced. Okay. Yes. And why go through this company specifically? Because... Um, 100% of the proceeds for the company, the purchase of the looms, went right to the families in Chile that were helping to sustain their families, um, educating them, buying food for them, helping to repair their houses, right? Those were some of the things on the bookmark. Do you want to actually show them that, that bookmark? So each of the looms came mm -hmm. with um, a bookmark that told specifically where the wool that was in the yarn that was in each of the kits came uh -huh. from and how it was going to help the families. Oh, great. Wow, that's awesome. And then what do you do with the final product? Do you send it back to the families or do something else with it? Um, so we talked, we learned a lot about Chile and how they, you know, how the process of the wool, making the wool mm -hmm. and, um, and how the purchase from the grant was going to go directly to the families. Mm -hmm. um, and our school, Morley, has a um, partnership with a school in Haiti. Um, and I'm going to be going to Haiti actually at the end of June. Oh wow! Um, so we're selling the hats to be um, purchased on Haiti Day, okay, um, which is May 16th, mm -hmm. um, and the proceeds will go to help um, educate a child um, in Haiti. Mm -hmm. So it's about $200 per year to educate a child in Haiti. Oh wow! Yes, well, that, that's really excellent. Yes. And we had Ryan Cleary on a few episodes back to talk about the grant with the art exchange with Haiti. So it's great to see that there's a, that continuing yeah, connection there. Yeah, it's a great partnership. Yeah. yeah. And so um, the kits, you want to show them a little bit? Yeah, Zoe, can you show me what's in the kit? There's looms. Okay, the big so ones and little ones. Mm -hmm. And 
there's a hook. We picked the yarn with it. Do you want me to help you take out the one that you're working on now? So this was the one. So tell us about this one compared to the other one. So this one is a small one. Mm -hmm. We we um, go around it twice. Yeah. And then we get the hook and pick only the bottom one off and put it over the top. Okay. And that helps make it the makes hats? the actual. It's actually cool to see because the kids actually they don't understand in the beginning. Wasn't it hard to see in the beginning? Uh, how is this going to be a hat? And then um, as we started going around. You mm -hmm. see the hat turning into a hat. And then oh, at the wow. end, when it comes together, what do we all do in room three? We cheer. We cheer. We cheer. <laughs> we say, Zoe finished her hat. Woo! Right? So it's just a celebration. It's yeah. A, yeah. It's great to see how, you know, something like this, like teaching children this age, mm -hmm. that something that they're doing is directly going to help people in need. Yeah. And that's great that you guys did it in class too, and you could do it all together. Did you like making your hat? Mm -hmm. How many hats have you made? Um, like all together. Yeah, as a big group, and then how many have you made? Seventy all together, and I made one hat. Wow, but it looks like you're working on a second one? Yeah, oh. and we've made pom-poms. Okay. So for some of the um, fine motor control, some of them at the young age, like kindergarten and first grade, mm -hmm. um, the the grant, the people that we bought, got the grant from, mm -hmm. um, sent us pom pom makers. So oh, great. yeah, so some of the kids were making pom poms. Mm -hmm. So it was a great way to, you know, the fine motor and problem solving. Yeah. And there's some children that, you know, were getting frustrated. So mm -hmm. their peers came in and helped them. Right? You were a really big help, when you, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Were you pretty good at making hats? Mm -hmm. There we go. That's always good. Yeah. And, and how did that tie into the broader curriculum? Um, well, in first grade, so um, I'm on the vertical team for social studies. Okay. So um, one of the big components is the service learning. Mm -hmm. um, so giving back to the community, um, making these, and you know, like we talked about, like being entrepreneurs and what you can do to help your community. Mm -hmm. Morley does the Red Wagon Food Drive, which okay. Don, Don O'Connor um, organizes, and the Backpack Brigade. So mm -hmm. being a community school, um, this was just another. You know, another just another like, you know, a, a way to get involved with the community yeah. and to show children that they can have a direct impact on helping others mm -hmm. um, and understanding different parts of the world. So we're doing a lot with Haiti okay. and in um, first grade, it's a great way to compare our culture in West Hartford with um, the culture in Haiti and how different they are and mm -hmm. some similarities. And was this just for the younger kids or is this for No, we did it with book age? buddies. Okay. So we did it with fourth graders. Mm -hmm. um, our book buddies are third graders, so we did it with our book buddy class. Great. Um, yeah, and even the kindergartners got involved. Yeah, wow, yeah. how awesome. And what yeah. a great way to learn about a different culture and It was and great. It was country. just very organic, which was, which was great for the kids. Was this your first grant? It the actually foundation? was my second. Okay. So um, I was trying to think the other night, back in the day before the iPad, um, <laughs> I wrote it for, um, it was a tablet. I don't even know what it was called back in the day. Okay. Um, yeah, it was, I wrote it for a tablet when yeah. I worked at Duffy School. Okay. Yeah, so it's my second grant, grant through the foundation. And what's that process been like working with the foundation? It's, they're just so su supportive and so amazing. And, mm -hmm. you know, I always have people from the foundation stop in and see what we're doing and get excited and it's just a it's a great experience they're so generous well that's awesome and yeah. we on the foundation love to support outreach in the community and in the broader world and teaching kids about different cultures other than their own is something that's really important for the foundation and for the kids in general Yeah, the world in general yeah and yeah. if you can get kids making something then that's great. My brother learned how to crochet when he was in first grade because he was too fidgety in class. and it, He would crochet in the back, so I'm sure this is a great way for kids to burn off some energy and have some fun doing it. It is. It is. It's, it's great. And some of the kids that I didn't think were going to take to it mm -hmm. have become um, garment makers, essentially. <laughs> wow. Maybe generated so, some lifelong knitters. Yes, exactly. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Well, guys, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciated learning about your grant. Thanks for having us. It was great. And now I'd like to welcome Monsi Rich, who teaches pre-K through fifth grade Spanish at Charter Oak and a section of Spanish 3 at Conard High School. 
Now, Monsi, your grant was called A Trip to the United Nations. Can you tell me a bit about the grant? Sure. Um, the idea is stemmed out from the fact that I was always excited about learning world languages. That's what I'm doing at Charter Oak, obviously. Mm -hmm. And because of my background, um, you know, I'm from Spain and I studied international business prior to becoming a teacher. So mm -hmm. um, when I first came to this country and I visited the United Nations and I got to see the scope of the organization and all the wonderful things that the, the, everybody who's there and works for them uh, mm -hmm. does, I thought, um, why couldn't I just take my, my older students there and get to experience the same kind of things sure. that I went through? So, mm -hmm. so that's how I came up with the idea. So what students did you bring? Actually, the trip itself was for fifth graders. Okay. And this year we have uh, two classes, two, sec two sections of fifth grade. Okay. So um, about how many students is that? It was forty-four students. Okay. okay who went to the um, in addition to the principal, mm -hmm. the IB coordinators, some teachers, and myself. Okay. And you went from West Hartford down to New York to check out the United Nations. What did you do when you were there? Yes, the trip itself uh, took a long time because it was like a, a three-hour ride, and we we traveled by co uh, coach uh, bus. Mm -hmm. And once we got there, we had the tickets and everything already okay. purchased because you really have to make sure that everything is planned way ahead oh, of time. I'm sure. So once we got there, we went through security, we got our passes, we went to more th uh, through more security because they check your bags, obviously, because of all the you know issues globally nowadays with terrorism. Mm -hmm. So once we went through security, we, we visited the outside premises. Okay. And then when it was close to the time when we had the tours, we went inside and then we had to split in three different groups. Hmm. Each one had one of the tour guides. They were all multilingual. So we split in like this. And so each group was, um, you know, very much, very much personalized because each uh, group of kids asked different questions. Mm -hmm. And what did they see when they were on the tour? Was it just a tour of the main area where all of the representatives from all the nations meet, or were there, was there more to it than that? Actually, the facility is huge. Okay. And just the outside itself, you know, just the outside grounds mm -hmm. have a lot of things to visit. They have the, the Ark of um, Return, which is a memorial to the um, the transatlantic uh, slavery trade oh, and the wow. victims of slavery, and basically it's a memorial made made out of um, granite, and it depicts the the actual space that the slaves had inside the boat when they traveled through the the, the ocean, mm -hmm. and it was be, it's hard, it was hard uh, breaking just to see how little the space was and how I mean. I, no wonder why um, many of them died along the way because it was mm -hmm. really, there were harsh conditions. So that was one of them. Then they, they got to see the sculpture of the knotted gun that was donated by, the, by Luxembourg. That okay. was also pretty cool. It's actually a big metal knotted gun and oh. the students got to, to take pictures there. Yeah. Then, um, so that was outside. There were other things, but those were the, the most relevant ones. Mm -hmm. So once we went through the tour, mm -hmm. the first things that we got to see, one of them was the, the General Assembly Hall, which was the most impressive thing for the students to see. Mm -hmm. That's where the 193 member nations meet once a year, including the President of the United States. Mm -hmm. So we got to, to visit that. They saw the places, the booths, where all the interpreters translate because not everybody speaks the same language, even though they have many official languages. So each country has translators or interpreters who actually translate mm -hmm. as the conversations and the speeches are being given. Mm -hmm. so, so that was impressive. Then we were lucky because that day there was an emergency security council meeting. Oh, but luckily wow. for us, the meeting just adjourned prior to us you know, having to go there. Mm -hmm. So we were able to go inside the Security Council um, really? chamber. Wow. And that was pretty cool because the kids knew that just minutes ahead of that visit, um, they had been decided on um, crucial issues glo globally. Um, and it was just, you know, the magnitude of the that idea was uh, great. So. Were you able to meet with anyone who works for the United Nations or was it just a tour of the facilities? We only talked to uh, the tour guides who are employed by the UN and okay. those are the ones who um, answer all the questions you may have. Mm -hmm. In fact, our students, we are an IB school, an international baccalaureate school, and our students uh, think globally. So the, the goal of this um, pedagogical philosophy is to create internationally mindedness, um, mm -hmm. internationally minded students. Yeah. And because of that's what they work on throughout the curriculum, they ask lots of questions. They were great inquirers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that ties into a really valuable point. 
how did this trip tie into their larger learning experience throughout the year and the curriculum that you're teaching? It actually um, boggled my mind to see how many extra additional connections we made to the curriculum that um, beyond what I expected originally. First, I thought it was a great way for them to realize the importance of uh, speaking languages. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there's many languages spoken at the UN. The tour guides were multilingual. Mm -hmm. So what better way for my students to realize the importance of, of, of speaking other languages than going to the place where that's the that's the norm sure not only that and and I w hopefully I, I was trying to convey to them that that would open a lot of doors in the future mm -hmm. so so there was one connection you know global languages yeah. uh, glo global um, rather world languages and then they made connections through e ELA um, um, prior to the visit, the students read two books, PAX and the uh, Home of the Great. Okay. And those, that was called the Global uh, Read Aloud. Hmm. So basically, they read the people from, students from all over the world pick mm -hmm. certain books, and then they, they, they talk through Skype or other social media um, companies about, the, they comment about the book, they talk about, they share ideas and ask questions to each other. So we did mm. that and that was pretty cool because they Skype with uh, a school in Alberta, oh, wow. Canada. Then um, uh, one of the other things, I don't know if you've heard of Asante uh, Sana, which is a non-profit organization. Hmm. They actually, in their electricity unit, they got to Skype with a school in Tanzania. Oh. And they got to ask questions about what kind of um, what kind of electricity the, the country had, mm -hmm. um, resources, alternate sources of um, energy production. And while Skyping, they realized there were some glitches in the connections. So they got to see how how better, how much better we have it in the United States than other places around the world. Mm -hmm. So they also made connections with the social studies. They went to Connard and they okay. met with a group of human rights, a group of students who are studying human rights, okay. and they created forums, they, they separated, they split in groups, and they talk about um, food, um, food, um, consumption, food production, and mm -hmm. then uh, lack of food in certain areas around the world. So all uh, human rights related, related issues, so that was great. Yeah. In addition to that, they got to see, um, they got to share about the trip with our the whole school. Mm -hmm. We have two uh, monthly assemblies, we okay. call the STAR Student Assembly, so they got to um, to share that, they had a, they shared pictures and they explained everything about the visit. They created a wonderful video that I don't know if they'll have a chance to see, where they talk about peace and the visit to the United Nations. So wow, well that sounds like a fabulous trip and a ton of learning about how to be a global citizen before and after the trip. I am I'm really impressed because as a fifth grader myself, I don't think I would have been able to handle all of that and process it. So, Monsi, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciated the opportunity to learn about your grant. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Charter Oak, I want to just thank the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools, because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't have never had the opportunity to do so. Well, so thank you very thank much, you. And, and we love to make opportunity happen. Thank you so much. Finally, I'd like to introduce Sue Winslow, a seventh grade social studies teacher at Bristow Middle School, who's here to talk about her grant, Silkworms and Their Importance to Ancient China. Sue, can you tell me a bit about your grant? Sure. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the foundation. This is, I think, the fifth year in a row that they have given me the grant for this, oh, which wow. is awesome. So many kids have benefited from this. Mm -hmm. Uh, one of the um, areas that we study in seventh grade social studies is China. So we start with ancient China and we move to modern China. Mm -hmm. And one of the keys to ancient China's success was the breeding of silkworms and the making of silk. And when this became um, a huge product for China, it, they had a monopoly on it. So China was the only country that knew how to make silk and everybody wanted it. So mm -hmm. part of why I want the kids to learn about this is so they understand how one itty bitty caterpillar can create something that a whole empire was founded on. And how does one itty bitty, itty bitty <laughs> caterpillar create a whole empire? Create a whole empire. Well, first of all, um, a silk moth lays eggs mm -hmm. and we have that right in the classroom so the kids can actually see it. And the eggs hatch and they are these itty bitty little caterpillars. And then the kids get them and they bring them home. I give them mulberry leaves that they feed the caterpillars. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, they get to be about this big. And then once wow. they get to that size, they will go into a cocoon and start spinning silk. Mm -hmm. 
And then once they're in the cocoon, and I have some samples here that I can show you, uh, the kids have a choice. They can boil the cocoon, which kills the silkworm on the inside, and you can hear it. Whoops, let's see if we can hear it. It's this one. I don't know if you can hear oh, that. Oh, yeah, you can. Can you hear that? That's yeah, that's much louder than I would have thought. Yeah, that's the pupa on the inside. So then once they do that, they can sort of take the silk and unravel it and see how the Chinese got silk. Oh. Or they can just wait and the silkworm will turn into a moth and then the moth huh. makes its way through through the cocoon. How did the ancient Chinese do it? Did they boil them or did they wait? They boiled them because mm. when the silkworm comes through the cocoon, I don't know if you can see that, it stains it. And so the oh. silk would be ruined. So instead oh. they would boil it, they would um, harvest all the silk and then they would spin it into cloth. And that was the basis of the Chinese economy for hundreds and hundreds of years. So Now I have to ask, you said that the worms got to be about this big. How do the parents feel about worms <laughs> this big coming home? Oh, what a great question. Um, the first year I made the mistake when I got the grant of not telling the parents ahead of time. And I learned very quickly that a lot of parents did not want this little critter home. So now I have a contract that I have the kids sign with their parents that says, my child is bringing home uh, this silkworm. It stays right in its container. So it's, it, most of them have a little cover and so they never get out. And then when it becomes mm. a moth, it can't fly. It's bred not to fly. Oh. So I say to the parents ahead of time that this little critter is not gonna be roaming around their house. Well, that's probably reassuring for most of them. Yes, I think it's the only way that they would be able to be brought home. <laughs> so. And how many students participate in the grant? Um, I get it for the entire seventh grade at Bristow, so that's okay. about 145 kids. It's optional, so not everybody has to bring them home. Some mm -hmm. kids can't even look at them. When I bring <laughs> them in the classroom, they just can't even handle it, and some kids love it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really an optional project for them to sort of understand in a real uh, world way mm -hmm. and with a real touch way, you know, what something like this can do to an entire country. And in fact, we talk about the Silk Road and how China was opened to the world and the world was open to China on mm -hmm. the Silk Road. And we compare that to the modern day internet mm -hmm. and how the difference that that has made in the world. So it's a really good modern connection uh, as well. How many students end up participating in bringing home the cocoons? I'd say probably about half. Okay. Um, and then some kids will bring them home and sometimes you get a dud. And that's really hard for the kids. You'll get a silkworm that just doesn't do much mm. and it might never spin. And that's disappointing. But I always have some in the classroom. Okay. So the kids, if it doesn't work out at home, they can always look at the ones in the classroom. Well, that's great. So. Nice consolation prize for them. Yeah. And do you do anything like that with any of the other cultures that you're studying? Or is it just this grant funding specifically for China? Well, I think any project that's hands-on for kids is a lot more fun. So mm -hmm. this is the only one that I've gotten an actual grant for. Okay. But um, when we study the Middle East, for example, we try mm -hmm. to do a lot with kind of model United Nations and having the kids represent different countries and talk about the issues that go on in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In the India unit, we do similar things. So we're trying to do as much hands-on as we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the only live project that we actually <laughs> okay. uh, do in yeah. seventh grade. Now, you said that this grant has been funded for five years in a row now. Can you tell me a bit about your interaction with the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools? It's been wonderful. This is the kind of project, can you get by without this? Of course you can, mm -hmm. but it's something fun. The kids remember this. 10 yeah. years from now, they can't remember when the Han Dynasty ruled in China, but they can remember why silk was so important. Mm -hmm. So. To me, these are the fun things that the foundation can give to these kids mm -hmm. that I might not be able to afford on my own to do. So the foundation's been great. Um, I got a standing desk for uh, through the foundation oh, great. a couple years ago, which again is for kids that you know like to move in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And without the grant, I don't think I could have done that. So it helps bring to the classroom things that as a teacher, you just couldn't afford to give to all students. Mm -hmm. it's, it's excellent. Sure, and now especially with Connecticut's budget climate, I think that is becoming even more important to more members of the West Hartford community. And uh, you know, it's great to see an actual real life example of what students can do with their time and how teachers can get them to remember things. And 
like you said, the students will remember this 10 years from now when they brought home their silkworms. Oh yeah, I still get postcards from students saying, Mrs. Winslow, oh, really? I still remember that <laughs> silkworm experiment that we did. And yeah, it's, it's fun. It brings mm -hmm. history to life for kids. Mm -hmm. And I think if the foundation can give kids that, that's an amazing thing to give. Yeah, yeah. Well, Sue, thank you so much for your time. I really you. appreciate you coming on here. Thank you. Thank you again for watching another episode of The Foundation Presents. If you would like to support the Foundation for West Hartford Public Schools, please go to fwhps.org.